All right, it's the second week of Advent. Advent's just preparation. Of course, we're preparing our, our hearts and our minds for this time of year when we celebrate Christ's birth. We talked about uh, hope last week, and today uh, we will talk about faith. And now, if it were up to me, I think I would have put faith first because I don't think you really have hope unless you have faith. But traditionally, hope comes first, and then um, after, honestly, after hope, it just depends. You could follow so many different Advent schedules. We're going to do uh, hope, faith this morning, uh, then joy, then love, and we've got one more Sunday in December, December so probably look at peace on the, on the day after Christmas. So um, I asked last week, who has a Christmas list? The kids are gone now. They're, they're the ones really keeping track of, of uh, what they need uh, for Christmas this year. Uh, but you, might, you may have one. You probably don't. You probably have a list of things that you're buying for other people. Um, but last week I asked if you could remember when you did have a Christmas list, and particularly when you were younger, the anticipation that would build towards what will I get on my list? Will I get everything? Will I get some of it? Will I get none of it? Um, how, how will that go? And of course, uh, we know Christmas is coming because we have a calendar. Anybody, anybody live off of a calendar? Anybody, anybody think they could get by without a calendar? Even, even the retirees, you know, it's not like you just stopped keeping track of time. You have, you're busy, you have a schedule, you have things that you're doing, and we track it uh, with our calendar. Has anyone ever got off track? <laughs> I can't remember what day it is, maybe end up in the wrong month. Uh, here in a few weeks, we'll be, you'll be writing down the date. You'll be in the wrong year. When we get into January, you'll be writing 2021. Sometimes we get off track, but is the calendar ever wrong? I mean, it's, yeah, it's 2021, right? Like, they get the calendar right. You know, we're all working off of the same calendar, and we have faith that the calendar is correct, now, you probably haven't really thought about it that way before because it's never been wrong. Like, do you have to think about, like, when you get your new calendar for the year, and probably most of you are just working off of your phone now anyways, but do you buy the 2022 calendar and go through it to make sure it's right? No, you just, it's right. You know, you just believe that it's right. So you put faith in that calendar that is right. So we know we're getting ready for Christmas because we have a calendar and we're following the calendar and December the 25th is 20 days away from today. Now, if you are one of the kids that just went back to children's church, they're not keeping track on the calendar so much, are they? How did they know to make a Christmas list? You told them, right? <laughs> you, you said Christmas is coming. Why don't you make a list? Maybe you said for mom and dad or for grandma and grandpa. Maybe you said for Santa. But you told them Christmas is coming. Why don't you make a list? How many of them, if, if you have kids or you have grandkids or you can remember that time, said, I don't believe you. <laughs> I don't believe you. I'm not going to make a list this year. I don't believe it's coming. It, it just doesn't happen, right? So the, the kids aren't following the calendar, but they are putting their faith or they're putting their trust in you as mom or dad or grandma or grandpa, aunt and uncle, that you are telling them what's true. Christmas is coming, so I'm going to make a list. Biblical faith, we're going to talk about faith this morning, leads to biblical hope. And we talked about hope last week. Well, our hope, what's our hope for today? Hopefully, it's not that you're going to be rich, that you don't have to worry about a calendar anymore, you're going to have lots of money in your bank account. That every, Hopefully, your hope is in uh, eternal life with Jesus Christ. That's our future hope. We have a hope for today that God, I'm not going to get ahead of myself, so we're really getting into faith there. So we were reminded last week, I reminded us all that uh, we, we have the promise of Scripture that God is with us, Emmanuel, God with us, he's with us today, but we also have a hope that we will be with him in the future, either when our, these earthly tents that we wear, our bodies wear out and we, and we pass from this world, or when he returns. So we have a, a hope for the future. 
Romans 8, 24 and 25, I could have shared these uh, last week, uh, talking about hope. Now, hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes what he sees? If you can see it, you don't have to hope for it. It's right in front of you. But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. So the, the Jewish people had hope that their Messiah would come because they had faith and trust in God and his word, and uh, they, were, they, were, uh, they trusted in the way that he has treated them in the past and that he would treat them the same in the future, so they had hope uh, for a Messiah. Today we have hope for this future glory with him because of our faith in God and his word and how he has treated us in the past. So this morning, uh, we talked about hope last week. This morning we're gonna talk about faith. Faith is the building block that we place our hope on. And our faith is, uh, is, in, is in Jesus. We're gonna look at what faith is. Uh, we're gonna look at some examples of faith from this account of Jesus' birth. We call it the Christmas story. Uh, it's not really a, a story in the sense that somebody made it up. This is a, a biblical account. And then we're gonna look at um, the realities. How do we deal with faith when we're, when we're dealing with our, our present day reality? So uh, as I was getting ready for this message, I read this statement and it got me thinking. Waiting and faith go hand in hand. You ever experienced that? Waiting and faith go hand in hand. Hope and faith, or excuse me, hope and waiting go hand in hand. We know that it was, it was here in this, in this verse, Romans 8.25. We hope for what we don't see and we wait for it with patience. All right, if you have small kids in the home, maybe they're waiting right now for Christmas with impatience, but we wait for our hope with patience. And so it seems like when we try to exercise our faith, sometimes we have to wait. Like it's just not, you know, we don't pray and just instantly uh, we, we have what we were praying for. And so uh, sometimes young couples wait uh, on the Lord as they, they, they uh, try to have a baby. Sometimes uh, maybe older couples uh, are, are waiting for their uh, their their. Uh, for reconciliation with a family member. Maybe uh, you're, you're, you're praying for the salvation or the return of a prodigal son or daughter, and so you're waiting in that. Maybe dealing with a, a health issue that you would just like to be through with, but it, but it still persists, and so we wait. And, and maybe you have some other situation that you're dealing with in your life this morning and it feels like you are just looking to the Lord and you're just, you're just waiting. So here's a definition for faith. Faith is complete trust or confidence in something. And typically we put that faith or trust in confidence in something or in someone because we know things about the person or the thing that we're putting our faith in. So uh, how many of you, uh, hopefully Craig has got a picture here. I sent it to him kind of last minute this morning. How many of you had one of these chairs before? <laughs> Why is everybody laughing? Because <laughs> I'm talking about faith and I put a picture of this chair on the screen, right? How many of you have, have either experienced uh, or witnessed the collapse of one of these things? <laughs> yeah. Um, on the other hand, I've got one of these choir chairs right here. You know, I, I, I know how much we paid for these chairs. Uh, I can look at it and I can see nothing's torn. Uh, it's, it's made out of uh, some sort of metal. The welds look good, nothing's sagging. I watch the choir members sit in the chairs every week. Uh, I'm 44 years old, so I have sat in a lot of chairs in my life. I would look at that chair especially if it's been out on your back patio for 10 years, I would be suspect. But I look at this chair and I think, do, I, do you even think about it? How many of you came in this morning, looked at the chair and thought, I wonder if it will hold me? We, we have enough experience to know, there's no trick, this one's gonna hold me. <laughs> We've experienced enough life to, to just quickly look at a chair and say, I'll sit in that chair or to look at a chair and maybe test it before we sit in it. Faith is having confidence in what we know. I, I look at that and I know it's gonna hold me. I look at that and I think, well, I'm not so sure. And so 
uh, we have knowledge, we have understanding, and then we exercise that faith. I could say, I, oh yeah, that'll hold me. Okay, Pastor Jeff, why don't you sit in it? Oh no, you won't catch me sitting in that chair. Well, if, I, if, if my faith is true, then I will exercise my faith and, and sit down in the chair. And so, the question that uh, I'd like to look at this morning is what did Mary and Joseph know that allowed them to believe what the angel told them so many years ago when they were visited? All right, so uh, we're gonna actually look at three, uh, what I would say would be faithful Jewish uh, believers. They believed in God, they were considered upright, they were considered just, they, they were obedient to the laws and the customs of, of the religion. And, and their responses. So we have, actually, before we go to Mary and Joseph, uh, we'll look at Zechariah. And, um, and he, Zechariah is a priest. He lived in a small town in Judah. Um, he, was, uh, he, he served the Lord. He was, he was a servant of the Lord. He's a teacher of the law. He would go to the temple, and he would do faithfully um, fulfill his priestly duties. So we know a couple of things about Zechariah. He was married to a woman named Elizabeth. She was also uh, from the line of, of Levi, so they were, they were considered a couple with double honor. They both were from Levitical families. Um, they were older in years, and they had no children. So let's look at, at Luke chapter 1. I don't know if I told you where we were going. Luke chapter 1, uh, and we're going to read uh, starting in verse 5, and just look at, at Zechariah, this, this, this uh, man who was faithfully serving the Lord. It says uh, in Luke chapter 1, verse 5, in the days of Herod, king of Judah, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah. And he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. So in other words, they had faith in who God was, they, they knew their Old Testament scriptures, and they were obediently walking in the things that God had for them. In other words, they, they, knew, about, they knew about God like I know about the chair, and they were walking it out. They were being righteous. They, they were exercising their faith by living their life uh, in accordance with God's word. So, uh, so Zechariah, he's serving the Lord. Uh, it says they had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and both were advanced in years. They were older. Now, while he was serving as priest before God when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, and that's, there were 24 divisions, and so you would just rotate through. Your division would serve in the temple for a week in Jerusalem, and then you would go back to your home. And then in 24 weeks later, your division would be called up again, and you'd go and serve in the temple. So he was serving in the temple in Jerusalem, and he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. This was considered a great privilege. They were chosen by lot, and, and uh, the, the scholars say that once, once your name was chosen, your name's taken off the list. There, was enough, there were enough priests that it was like a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to go in um, and burn incense before the Lord. So verse 11, and there appeared to him, as he burned the incense, an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense, and Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. Understandable. You know, we're, we came here to worship this morning. What if, a, if an angel appeared on the stage before us? There would be some awe. There would be some wonder. Maybe at the back you wouldn't be afraid. I'd be afraid. This is a natural response. The angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. Now, what would he have been praying for? He was praying for a child, yeah. He's also, he was also a priest. Uh, he was also teaching the people about what the Old Testament scripture says. And, and we looked at Old Testament scriptures that were pointing to a Messiah. And so probably he would have been praying for the salvation of the nation of Israel. And it says, uh, your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness and many will rejoice at his birth for he will be great before the Lord. He must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. He will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him 
We know that's Jesus, he didn't at the time. He will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. All right, so here's Zechariah's response. This is amazing. You're gonna have a child and this child will prepare the way for the Lord. Um, and so this is a unbelievable that the angel's even there and then the message that he has for Zechariah is, is equally unbelievable. And Zechariah said to the angel, how shall I know this? For I am an old man and my wife is advanced in years. Faith or no faith? He didn't have faith. He was similar to, to uh, Abraham and Sarah when Sarah heard that they were gonna have a child and she laughed. And he said, how can this be? We're, we're old. I can't, I, I don't understand, I don't understand this. How shall I know this? I don't get it, he says. This can't happen. The angel answered him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and I was sent to speak to you and bring you this good news and behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place because you did not believe my words which will be fulfilled in their time. Don't we all have lack of faith sometimes? Like, it, it would be easy to say to Zachariah, Zachariah, you've got an angel in front of you. I, why, why, why didn't you believe the angel? But w don't we all have a lack of faith? Habakkuk 2 verse 4 tells us that the righteous will live by faith. And, and really, a, a lack of faith is any time we choose to stray from what God has for us. That could just be as simple as, as, as being angry with your, your, your kids or with your, your spouse, lashing out in anger, anger uh, a harsh word, uh, a selfishness, a me first attitude. All lack faith because uh, the righteous living by faith will obey the word of the Lord, which would say to be kind, to have, uh, speak encouraging words, uh, to, to follow the will of God. So it's, it's easy for all of us to lack faith to choose our way instead of God's way. Let's, let's look at Mary though. We're gonna look at Mary and then look at Joseph. This is a different reaction to a very similar experience. Uh, if we jump down to verse 26. In the sixth month, the angel of Gabriel was sent from God, this busy, busy time of year for Gabriel, to a city of Galilee named, named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. So we have uh, Mary, who the angel is sent to. She is engaged or betrothed to a young man named Joseph. Uh, they don't live in um, a, a town in Judah, but they're down in Galilee. And Galilee would, it was largely a Gentile area, but these, this was a Jewish couple living in a largely Gentile area. And uh, it says they were, they were faithful. And, and uh, the angel came to Mary and he said to her, verse 28, greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. She was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting might this be. Understandably, same thing, it's an angel. She's concerned, she doesn't know what's going on. Um, and the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and, as, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Now I don't know how much Mary was processing at this moment, but Mary was a descendant of David. And knowing her scriptures, she would, she would know that there was a promise that there would be someone from the line of David that would sit on the throne forever. And if she could have processed it all that quickly, I don't know that I would have, she would have, she heard the angel saying to her, you're gonna have a, a, a son, be called the son of the most high, the son of the almighty, this is a name of God, he's gonna be the son of God, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. She sent, the, the angel said to Mary, who, who came from, she lived in Galilee with the Gentiles. You're gonna have a son, be the son of the most high. He's gonna sit on the throne of David. 
It's an amazing message. Mary said to the angel, how will this be since I am a virgin? Now, it's a similar question to what Zechariah. Zechariah said, how shall I know this for I'm an old man? She said, how will this be since I am a virgin? Since I am a virgin. Apparently, there's a, there, was a, there was a difference in the response. Gabriel said to Zechariah, because of your lack of faith, you won't be able to speak until it happens. But Gabe, uh, the angel answered Mary in verse 35, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born to you will be called Holy, the Son of God. Amazing, the Son of God, the angel's telling Mary, will be in her womb. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. This is the promise from the angel. For nothing will be impossible with God. And and look at Mary's response, which really kind of confirms that verse 34 wasn't a lack of faith, more like, okay, God, I, I understand what you're saying. Just help me to understand how... Do you, do you have any details for me? Because Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. It's a response of faith. Whatever you say, Lord, let it be to me just that way. And, and it makes me think of, um, you know, God calls uh, to each of us in different ways, but some of the great callings of God in Scripture, um, I think of the the little boy Samuel when God called to Samuel in the night. He didn't know who it was, and and Samuel went um, to the priest, and the priest said, "Look, next time you hear it, answer in this way." And so when when God called to Samuel his name, he said, "Speak, Lord, for your servant hears." Um, in Isaiah, when he had the vision, of, vision from the Lord, Isaiah's response is, Woe is me, for I am un- undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. And a few verses later, he said, Here am I, send me. And we've got Mary this morning. Uh, the angel comes to Mary and says, You're going you're gonna to conceive a son. He's going to be the son of God. Even though you're a virgin, you're going to give birth. He's going to sit on the throne of David. And Mary's response is, let it be to me according to your word. That's a response of faith. That's what God's asking of us today when he he nudges us, when he prompts us, when we read something in his word. Hopefully our response is, when we read something in his word, let it be to me according to your word. Let me live according to your word. Let me do according to what you're calling me to do, God. That's faith, saying no to self and saying yes to God. All right, so finally, Joseph. The angel came to Zechariah, then the angel came to Mary. It appears as though Mary then went, well, we know Mary then went to visit Elizabeth, came home after three months, and and it seems like this is when the angel came to Joseph. Uh, The guy's always the last to find out what's going on. Anybody experience that? (laughs) That's not a biblical truth this morning, just, a, just an observation. All right, so Joseph's getting caught up to speed in Matthew chapter 1, uh, verse, starting verse 18. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying... So just think about this. Joseph, he's engaged to Mary. Uh, this betrothal period was a, was a year long. It was really much stronger than our engagement today. They were considered to be married, but they, they still lived apart. They had not consummated their marriage yet. And, uh, but if they were to separate, it required a certificate of divorce. So this, is a, this was a very strong commitment to one another. I think, and probably Mary went off and visited Elizabeth, came back three months later, and Joseph finds out she's pregnant. Mary, what's going on? You know, I thought we were betrothed. Oh, we are, we are Joseph, but you're pregnant. I haven't been with anybody. 
You're looking at Joseph, are you thinking lack of faith at this point? You know, he hasn't seen the angel. I don't know if he's heard about the angel. He's just saying, you're supposed to be engaged to me. We haven't been together, and yet you're pregnant. A certificate of divorce is what he's considering. So uh, the scripture says um, that he was a just man. So he's a a, a righteous person, someone who's who's following after the Lord. But he's also um, unwilling to put her to shame. So he has compassion on her. He doesn't... He doesn't uh, want to put her to shame. According to the law, he could actually have her stoned. The, the, um, the penalty for adultery was death by stoning. Um, and so he, he says, look, we're just, let me just think about taking care of it this way. But the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, verse 20, saying this, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, For that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Probably confirming exactly what Mary was telling him. Look, an angel came to me. The angel said the Holy Spirit would conceive a child in me. I haven't been with anybody. And now he gets this dream uh, saying that, that take Mary as your wife. That's what's conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. So Joseph gets this amazing dream, confirms everything that Mary probably has been saying to him. So what's his response going to be? A response of faith, like Mary responded, or a response of disbelief like Zechariah had responded. Verse uh, 24 says, when Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son and he called his name Jesus. All All three of these, Zechariah, Mary, Joseph, they all had knowledge of the scripture. They, they were all uh, considered to be just or righteous. Uh, Zechari- the description for Zechariah says he was walking blamelessly before the Lord. What causes Mary and Joseph to respond in faith and Zechariah to respond in disbelief? Zechariah's doubt led to him being mute uh, and not being able to speak uh, until... Elizabeth gave birth, Mary and Joseph were commended for their faith. In Titus, we've been talking about aligning our behavior with our beliefs. Our actions, we've talked about, reveal about what our faith is in. We have knowledge of God through his word. I look in this crowd and I see a lot of people, most of you come on a regular basis to worship on Sunday morning. Uh, Many, if not most of you, serve the Lord in in various capacities, either in the church or in the community or with other organizations. We consider to be faithful followers of God, and yet maybe we don't always respond in faith either. So how, how do we respond in faith? We, we, I mentioned the examples, maybe waiting for a baby or waiting for reconciliation amongst relationships or uh, waiting for that unsaved family member to say yes to Jesus or a prodigal to return back to the faith. Health issues that, that continue instead of get better. How do we respond in faith to these kinds of situations? Well, we can't just turn to a passage of scripture and say and read on the, on the 10th day of December, 2021, fill in the blank. You know, your, your situation will be resolved. We, we pray, we wait, we have faith in God, and we have to remember, though, that our faith is in God and his word and not the outcome of our circumstance. Philippians 2 verse 13 says, it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. We can have confidence that no matter what we're dealing with in life, that God is working um, in us for his good pleasure. 
And what would God's good pleasure in our life be? Romans 8, 28 says, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Now, when, we, when it says all things work together for good, that doesn't mean all things work together for the outcome that you want or the outcome that I want, but all things work together for um, us becoming conformed more and more to the image of Christ. That's our ultimate good, to become more and more like our Savior. And so God's working things together. The situation that you find yourself in is, is not uh, necessarily something God, that God has done to you, but it is certainly something that he has allowed you or he has allowed me to experience. And so he is working these situations together for our good so that we could become more and more like him. And that happens when we respond in faith. Here, here, are some, here, here, here are some passages that we could put our faith in this morning. Nothing will be impossible with God. Where scripture says that we should let, make our requests known to God in Philippians. It's not wrong to pray and ask God for the things that are on our heart because nothing is impossible with him. We also know that God loves us, John three sixteen. For God so loved the world. We're celebrating Christmas because God loved the world and he sent his son. He came in a manger, but we know he grew up and he lived the perfect life and he died as a perfect sacrifice for your sins and for mine. We have the promise that his spirit is with us. In John 14, 26, Jesus told his disciples, the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. He'll teach us and he'll bring to remembrance. He'll give us the words to say when we need the words uh, in, a, in any given situation. God promises us peace in our life when sometimes it's anything but peaceful. Next verse, John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Jesus came to give us peace. How do you have peace when everything is not going the way that you want it to go? You have peace when you know that God is working all things together for our good. Philippians 4, verse 7, um, verse 6 tells us that we should present our requests to God with thanksgiving, to let him know what's on our hearts. Verse 7 says in Philippians 4, the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. These are the things that we put our faith in. Uh, listen to 2 Peter 1, verses three and four. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. I love that. As we know God's word, as we learn about him through his word, God's power comes through our knowledge. And when we step out in faith or in obedience or saying yes to God, then his power is there to, to enable us to, to do the things that he called us to do. These are the verses, these are some of the building blocks of our faith. Not faith that God's gonna do what we want him to do in a particular situation, but faith that God is who he says he is in scripture and that he will do the things that he said he would do in the scriptures. And so we're called to read the word. We're called to understand it. We're called to do what it says. That's, that's living in faith. I read it, I understand it, I look at this chair, I know that it's new, it, 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 it there's nothing wrong with it. There, I, I can take a quick look at it. I understand that this is something I could sit in. We understand that what God's word says, we read it, we're learning. The next step is to exercise our faith by doing what it says, by taking a seat in the chair. The perfect example of faith for us is in the example of Jesus. If we read, if you read through and follow Jesus' life, we see him uh, saying, I do nothing uh, apart from the Father, that, that I don't do anything that the Father doesn't ask me to do, um, that, I'm, that he was here on earth to do the will of the Father. 
even right to the, the, the night before his crucifixion. He had his request and he made it known to God. Remove this cup from me, but not my will, but yours be done. He made his request known to God and he, then he said, but God, I will do what you want me to do in this situation. Do we have faith this morning to do what the word says? To say no to ourselves and to say yes to God. That's faith. We're gonna, we're gonna close this morning with, with prayer like we, like we normally do. I would encourage you, if you get a chance this week, read through Matthew chapter one and two. Uh, read through Luke chapter one and two. Look for these uh, examples of, of, of faith in these passages. Look for the, the hope that, are, that is in these passages. Uh, look for instances of joy in these passages. That's where we're gonna go next week. Why don't you bow your heads with me? We're gonna pray together. Maybe as we gathered here this morning, uh, you're not even sure that you have faith in God. You can believe uh, his word. Maybe you're just beginning to understand it. Maybe you've said yes to Jesus. The, the very first yes that you can give to Jesus is to say, Jesus, I'm, I'm a sinner. I understand that I cannot earn my way to heaven, but you came to earth to be with us, to set the example. And then you died on the cross for my sins so that I could have life. You didn't stay in the grave, but you were resurrected. You went to be with the Father. And that's our hope, that just as you went to be with the Father, that we too one day will go to be with the Father. Maybe you just need to say yes to Jesus in, in that way this morning. We've got our prayer partners this morning are, are gonna be at the front. You could come forward to uh, pray with them. Maybe you're just dealing with a difficult circumstance this morning. Or maybe you have been. Maybe you've got something coming up this week and you just need some encouragement. You, you wanna do what's right uh, and, and yet you know you're probably like me sometimes. We're prone to not have faith in situations. And so we, we want to, uh, maybe this morning you just need some prayer to say, um, Lord, I believe, help me to believe. Maybe you got something that the Lord's just been prompting you that he wants you to do, some next step in your walk with him. You haven't done it yet, but you just uh, have an idea that God's calling you to, to do something for him. And you need to step out in faith to do that. You can come this morning and pray with one of our prayer partners. Tell them, what, tell them what you're thinking about. Come and tell one of the pastors this morning, I've been thinking about this and I feel like God wants me to do it. I'd love to help you take the next step of faith in your walk with him this morning. Father, I said it already and I'll say it again. Thank you for sending your son. Thank you for uh, Jesus for being willing to humble yourself and come to this earth as a baby. All the power of God in that tiny little baby and yet dependent on Mary for, for, for milk and, and, and nourishment. Lord, you, you sent the example of being perfectly dependent on the Father at all times, living a life of faith that what God the Father had for God the Son at that time was right and it was good and accomplished the, the purpose for that uh, you were sent for and you, and you live daily by faith. You exercise that fa faith by doing the things that God put you on earth to do. You were the perfect example for us. Lord, I pray uh, that you would spur in our hearts to respond to you in faith this morning tomorrow, this next week, this Christmas season, and, and for the future, that we would be people of faith, choosing to do things according to your word, according to your will, even if it's not the easy thing, even if it's not the outcome that we're looking for. Would our complete trust be that you have our good 
in your mind and that you are working all things together for our good. Lord, help us to be conformed to the image of your Son. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me just close this morning by reading from Ephesians chapter 3. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Live in faith this week.